Hi, welcome to Dr. English's review of chemical bonding part two. Today we're going to talk about ionic bonding and properties of ionic compounds. So in this review we're going to discuss the idea of what is an ionic bond, how are ionic bonds formed, and using Lewis dot diagrams to represent ionic bonds, and properties of ionic compounds. So the first question is what is an ionic bond? Well if you recall in class, when we talk about ionic bond, we talk about the force of attraction between a positive ion and a negative ion. So what we're going to do today is to go into a little bit of detail of what exactly is that. So in an ionic bond, we're looking for a full transfer of electrons to form positive and negative ions. So over here in this animation, I have two spheres, a larger sphere with an electron, and a smaller sphere with no electron. So each of these initially, we can imagine them as atoms. So when this sphere, with its electron, loses that electron, goes over to here, it's going to become smaller. Because when an, uh, when an atom loses an electron, the ionic radius will be smaller than the atomic radius. Now on this sphere right here, we've gained that electron. My radius is going to become larger and it's going to have an overall negative charge. So you can see here, because this lost an electron, it's now positive. This gained an electron, it's now negative. When we talk about ionic bonding in this particular course, we talk about it occurring typically between metals and nonmetals. And yes, there are situations where you can have a compound that has an ionic bond that's all nonmetals, but we're not going to discuss that right now. And when we talk about the bond between um, two ions, we talk about electrostatic forces, these forces of attraction between positive and negative ions. So what I can do to represent this electrostatic force is say, okay, this is a positive ion, and snuggled up right next to it, I'm going to have a negative ion. So it's positive ion next to negative ion. And those opposite charges are really what's holding this compound together. But it's never just individual ions. Really, what we have here is that each positive ion is surrounded by negative ions. So here we have another negative ion, another negative ion. And surrounding each one of these negative ions is a positive ion. So positive, uh, positive, positive. And they're going to arrange themselves so they, so every positive ion is surrounded by negative ions, and every negative ion is surrounded by positive ions, and it's going into the page and out of the page uh, in a three-dimensional representation. So how are ionic bonds formed? Well, let's start with the metals. And metal atoms are going to lose electrons and become positive ions. So here I have a representation of a lithium atom. And when we talk about a lithium atom, it's going to have a positive nucleus and a certain number of shells where electrons are going to occupy. So for a lithium atom, the number of protons is going to be 3 because that's its atomic number. And because we're talking about atoms here, with atoms, protons will always equal electrons. So my number of electrons will also be 3. And if I look at my electron configuration, I can see that it is going to be 2-1. And again, this is the number of electrons. It should add up to the number of electrons that I have here. And if I was going to represent this in a Bohr model, I'd say, well, here's my positive nucleus. And in the first shell, I'm going to have two electrons. And in that second shell, I'm going to have one electron, and that's that one electron in the outermost shell that is my valence electron. And this is the electron that's involved in the ionic bond. This is the electron that I'm going to lose to make it a positive ion. So when this lithium ion loses this electron, there it goes, uh, the radius is going to get smaller. So now it's gone. Okay. The radius is going to get smaller, and now my ion has an overall positive charge. So when we look at the properties of this lithium ion, we still have three protons. We haven't changed the identity of the element, but the number of electrons is going to be different. I have less electrons right here, and this is reflected in my electron configuration. So this overall ion is positive because I have more protons, so I'm going to write the word more here, more protons than I have electrons. So that's talking about metal atoms and how they become ions. So now let's talk about nonmetal atoms. Well, a nonmetal atom is going to gain electrons and become a negative ion. So here I have a fluorine atom, and if I look at the statistics here, 
Okay, we're going to have nine protons. Again, we're dealing with an atom, so that means we're going to have nine electrons. And my electron configuration for fluorine is 2 7. So here I have seven valence electrons. So if I was to draw the Bohr model for this, I'd have a positive nucleus. And in that first shell, I'd have two electrons. And in that second shell, I would have seven valence electrons. Now when this atom becomes an ion, we're going to gain electrons, just like we see right here. So we'll see here comes an electron, it's going to, this atom is going to gain that electron, the radius is going to become larger, because if I go, for, as I go from atomic radius to ionic radius, my radius gets larger as I add an electron to that outermost shell, because we know in that outermost shell we have seven valence electrons occupying that space. If I add in another electron, which is also negative, it's got to accommodate that incoming electron and become larger, which is why the charge now here overall is negative. So if I look at the number of protons here, again, I still have nine protons, but now my number of electrons is greater than my number of protons, so I have more here, more, so which is why I'm going to have a negative charge. And also, my electron configuration at this point is going to be 2-8, which is just like the electron configuration from neon, so more stable in that aspect also. So Lewis dot diagrams to represent ionic bonds. So let's consider the compound strontium fluoride. And the electron configuration for strontium is 2, 8, 18, 8, 2, and the symbol here is SR. So the number of valence electrons I have here is two, so I'm going to put two dots in this outermost shell right here representing this strontium atom. Now I'm going to look at fluorine. Okay, the fluoride as an atom, it's going to be fluorine, and that has an electron configuration of two, seven, in a symbol of F. So this has seven valence electrons. So I'm going to put seven valence electrons around this fluorine symbol. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now the issue here is that I have two strontium valence electrons that both need to be removed. Okay, Strontium is going to lose both of those electrons as it becomes an ion. So what we want to see here basically is both of these electrons gone. But if we look at fluorine over here, it's not going to have enough room to occupy both of those valence electrons. So we need to represent another fluorine. So I'm going to put another fluorine with seven dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So now what's going to happen here? These are all atoms. The number of protons and electrons equal each other. But this strontium atom is now going to lose its electron. And we're going to say this electron is going to go here and this electron is now going to go here. So this strontium atom now becomes a strontium ion, Sr plus 2. And what we're going to see over here is we're going to have a bracket with a fluorine. Fluorine's charge is always minus 1. And I'm going to put a 2 in front here. And this is the shortest way to represent this Lewis dot diagram representing an ionic, uh, an ionic bond. So this 2 says I'm going to have uh, two fluorine ions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my original 7 in. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then this last dot represents the electron that basically came from the strontium atom. So one strontium ion with a plus two charge and two fluorine ions will basically account for all electrons lost and gained. Now one key thing to remember here, if I look at this strontium ion, what do I see? I see no dots, no dots. Strontium lost its valence electrons, lost them completely. The fluorine accepted them. So over at the fluorine ion, we see dots, and those dots represent valence electrons. What you can't do is look at the electron configuration for strontium and say, well, there's an eight here. I think I'll throw those dots around the strontium symbol. No, don't do that. Those aren't valence electrons. Those are core electrons what are on the inner shell, so you can't do that. So your metal will not have any valence electrons, no dots. Your nonmetal will have dots with the appropriate charge of minus one and the coefficient of two to represent 
two fluorine ions. And if you wanted to just write this uh, configuration out twice instead of putting the two in front, that's absolutely fine. So now let's look at the compound of potassium oxide. Potassium has an electron configuration of 2, 8, 8, 1 in a symbol of K. And oxygen has electron configuration of 2, 6. So if I was to do the valence electrons, which there's one valence electron, I do one right there, and oxygen has six valence electrons, so I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five, six. Now again, we get in the sort of the same situation as our previous example. This potassium has one valence electron that it's going to donate to oxygen, but oxygen is not going to have its full octet if it only gets one. So what we need to do is draw another potassium symbol, put another valence electron, and now what's going to happen is that we can basically say that this valence electron is going to go here, and this valence electron is going to go over here, and now my K becomes plus one because I have more protons than electrons, so a plus one charge. And again, I'm going to throw a two in front because there was two potassium atoms that each lost an electron to become two potassium ions. For oxygen, I'm going to put my symbol. I'm going to put my original six dots, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to put in my two yellow dots to represent the electrons that are gained from the potassium. I'm going to put brackets around the whole thing, and I'm going to put my minus two charge. So here we have a Lewis dot diagram representing the ionic bond between potassium oxide. Our last example is with aluminum sulfide. Now this, this gets a little crazy here. So the electron configuration for aluminum sulfide is 283 with the symbol of Al. And for sulfur, sulfur has uh, an electron configuration of 286 and a symbol of S. Now aluminum has three dots, so one, two, three fix that dot a little bit and sulfur has six dots so let's let's change up the color here let's make this one two three four five six now this is not going to be easy I have three valence electrons here and only two valence electrons that be can be accepted over here so I've really got to think about how many electrons total need to transfer and the common number here is going to be six so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw another aluminum symbol, three more dots representing valence electrons, and two more sulfur symbols right here, each having their six valence electrons. Do this really quick here and here. There we go. And now what I'm looking for is for all of these valence electrons over here to be transferred and accepted over here. So what am I going to see? Well, let's take this valence electron right here and let's transfer it to this spot. And let's take this valence electron and let's transfer it to this spot. And then we'll take this third one and we'll put it right here. So this aluminum atom has now become an aluminum ion because I've lost those three valence electrons. But this sulfur has its full octet, but not this one. So let's keep going. So I'm going to take this valence electron right here, and I'm going to put it in this spot. This valence electron right here, and I'm going to put it in this spot. And then finally take this last valence electron right here, and I'm going to put it in that spot there. So what do I end up with? Well, I end up with two aluminum ions, each with a charge of plus three, and I end up with three sulfur ions, sulfur with their original six valence electrons here and then I have the two electrons that are gained right here with an overall charge of minus two so this is now representing this Lewis dot diagram of aluminum sulfide as an ionic bond so let's keep going uh, properties of ionic solids in general Ionic solids are going to have high melting points. Uh, they're not good conductors of heat or electricity. 
uh, because they're solids. The ions can't move, therefore the electrons can't move, so they cannot conduct heat or electricity. Typically, all ionic solids, to some degree, are going to dissolve in water, to some degree. Uh, in AP chemistry, we talk about KSP values, but that's not covered in regions chemistry. Uh, so you're going to be no ionic solids as being more soluble or insoluble, but in general, most ionic compounds can dissolve to some degree. Or we can actually melt ionic solids, which is uh, sort of interesting to think about. If they are dissolved in water or melted, they are good conductors of electricity. And overall, ionic solids are generally hard in composition. And here, down here, we have a uh, visual of copper to sulfate. It's blue because copper is a transition metal. And this is composed of ionic bonds. So let's look at sodium chloride solid. Uh, NaCl solid. This is known as a poor conductor. In its solid form, we think of this more as table salt. Table salt. So what you might put on your french fries. Because it's a solid, the electrons can't move. So we say the electrons are immobile. So it can't form free moving sodium ions and chlorine ions. So it's not going to conduct electricity. And here's my image of sodium chloride as a crystal that you could commonly see on your dinner table. Now let's look at sodium chloride as a liquid. So this is a liquid form. This is a good conductor and I believe the melting point of sodium chloride as a liquid is 101 degrees Celsius, quite a high temperature. When it's melted we will have uh, sodium ions and chlorine ions moving and therefore they are good conductors of electricity. So electrons are able to move. Uh, in other words, they're mobile. Uh, molten sodium chloride, we don't hear about it very often because it's used in industry for various uh, processes that we're not going to go into right now. What you're more familiar with is sodium chloride in its aqueous form. Remember, AQ means aqueous, A-Q-U-E-O-U-S, aqueous. That is a good conductor because this is sodium chloride as a solid, dissolves in water. It is very soluble, will form sodium ions and chlorine ions. In this particular scenario, the electrons are able to move. They are mobile. So if I think of a sodium ion right here, it will be surrounded by water molecules. So I'm going to draw an oxygen right here, a hydrogen, a hydrogen up here, another oxygen down here with two hydrogens. And I know about water, and we'll talk about this more with uh, when we talk about covalent bonds, that oxygen is going to have a slightly uh, negative charge, slightly negative charge. And there's no, something known as an ion molecule force of attraction between the sodium ion and the water molecules. So breaking apart the solid sodium so that these ions are able to move. The same thing is going to happen here with these chloride ions. If I go and I draw water molecules around this, I'm going to have the hydrogens pointed more inwards. Uh, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. And where the hydrogens are going to have a slightly positive charge, a slightly positive charge, and there's going to be this weak ion molecule force of attraction between the water molecules and the chloride ions. So what did we learn in this review? Well, we went over what is an ionic bond. We talked about how ionic bonds are created. And we looked at some examples of how Lewis dot diagrams can be used to represent ionic bonds. And finally, we talked about some very general properties of ionic compounds. So need more help? Contact me. Here's my email address, and I hope this was helpful. Have a great day.